I quite like to put myself <laughs> in, well, somewhere near woodland, which is very appropriate considering what I'll tell you about next week's show. Hang on, we haven't even started this week's in a, in a while, but I, because I get the sound of the countryside, but I, <laughs> I'm surrounded by fields. Fields and fields and fields. And not many birds, which is really important because that's, <laughs> to me, that feels like the glue that you think, oh, I wonder where he is. What's that bird? Where is he? I am heading towards some cops, so we should be okay. Um, welcome to the photo walk. Have you ever read the, the book Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers, the, the late doctor, actually, Susan Jeffers? It, it's the sort of book that uh, armchair psychologists usually point you to, isn't it? Ah, <laughs> you know what you need to do? You need to read Feel the Fear, and I'm sure I've actually said it myself a number of times. But, um, you know, in a roundabout way, Shoe Dog, which is another very, very good book, which is a memoir, so many twists and turns, by the Nike man, Phil Knight. That book has uh, moments of the sentiment, Feel the Fear as well, I think. But Phil, well, Phil has quite the story, but Susan, well, here's, here's just a short excerpt from the the unofficial bio that she wrote a few years prior to passing away from cancer. And we lost her in 2012. Not quite sure how it can be unofficial when Susan actually wrote these words. I mean, you can't get much more official than the person who lived the story writing about the story. But by the by, I think of myself as somebody who seems to be constantly reinventing herself. I started out as a small town girl and became a big city woman. I love big cities. In my early life, I lived by the then rules, which means I got married early and had two children. And it didn't take long, though, for me to realise that the rules really weren't written for me. I was meant to be doing something in addition to raising a family. So I went back to school when my children were young, much to the shock of my mother and others who felt a woman's place was definitely in the home. I felt this was true, but only for women who wanted to be there and not true for those who didn't. So I persevered and attained my BA, master's degree and doctorate in psychology, which gives you an idea of, of how she felt the fear. But at that stage, the book wasn't around. She wrote the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, which uh, is this, well, I suppose you could call it manual for embracing fear in your world and saying, you know what? No, I'm doing this because I believe in it. It may be the book that armchair psychologists suggest, but you know, I've always taken bits of that book and I often smile as I find myself doing something that uh, I otherwise wondered whether I should. Not dangerous stuff, or well, maybe sometimes, but, but challenging stuff in the main. The stuff that's easy in life to say, uh, no, no, let me, build a, let me build a reason why I shouldn't do that instead of, oh, that's tricky, but go on, let's do it. But I do love the feedback that Susan kept as she tried to get that book that she wrote, the first book, after qualifying. Um, she got no after no after no from all these publishers that she sent the man manuscript to. No, 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 no. The worst rejection letter, she uh, said, that I ever got was that Lady Diana could be cycling nude down the street, giving this book away, and nobody would read it. And the rest, as they say, <laughs> Etc. Etc. Because it became a, uh, it was a bestseller, multi, 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 multi bestseller around the world. Anyway, my guest, oh look, turned up just in time. When I said I wanted birds, I meant birds, not sort of using the vernacular from, you know, the aircraft vernacular of birds. Yeah, you're very low. Anyway, my guest today, Simon Buckley, artist, writer, photographer, and explorer with a camera late at night. He needs to dig really deep to fight his fears, but um, he has so many other very, very important things to share with us today. Today on The Photo Walk. Well, I think if you are going to be a successful photographer, actually, in a way, the taking of the photograph is the end part, of the, it sounds like an obvious thing to be the end part of the process. Actually, you know, when you press the shutter, you are the sum total of all your experience and knowledge in that moment. Today then, Simon Buckley making the most extraordinary photo stories when we're either in bed or certainly our cameras and batteries are charging. 
The only show in the podcast sphere, it's the Friday Photo Walk. We take a walk with our cameras together, with your letters, your DMs and Facebook messages which drive the show. What's on the show? Well, I shall tell you in a moment. But first of all, I'd like you to think about change. We're supported by our friends at mpb.com, the number one platform in the UK, the US and Europe. With bases in Brighton, Brooklyn and Berlin, they all have to start with a B when it comes to buying, trading or selling quality used kit online. It's real that a picture, a moment can change the way we feel. We talk about change all the time on this show. It can change the way we see ourselves, change our understanding, change the rules. It can even provoke and change history. And mpb.com puts photo and video kit into more hands, more sustainably, so you can change too. Every month, visual storytellers like us sell more than 20,000 cameras and lenses to MPB, which means that you can choose used and get affordable access to kit that doesn't cost the earth and in some cases you'd never dreamt you'd even own. So sell the kit you're not using, trade it in for the kit you need to create. Buy used, spend less and get more by going to mpb.com. Buy, sell, trade and create right today on the show i have the most extraordinary idea from australia to make your books and magazines and stories come alive in another dimension we're collecting stuff we find in nature to make photo stories okay what really is important the camera or the photographer our fantasy photography island is taking shape. One of our listeners is finding photography is opening up his life again after a pretty torrid time personally. Another is shooting with a vintage camera following our call to shoot with stuff that you find in your attic. Being an introvert and inspiration today from an ultra runner, a little more from Nicky Heppenstall, and what intrinsically makes a picture from Jim Mortram. Shall we walk then? Coffee and Garibaldi's packed, check. Boots on, check. Long socks and leggings to avoid those nasties in the undergrowth, check. Spare batteries, cards or film, check. Earbuds in, check. Lens caps off, let's walk. I'm just going to make a reference photograph, so when I put this up on the show page today, and don't forget, the show page has... Don't forget, that's very radio cliché. The show page has uh, lots and lots of pictures on there from those that have contributed this week. Reference pictures also of um, our guest today. Uh, Links to that that we talk about. But um, for reasons that will become clearer probably next week than this, I have just seen a small wooded area that will be... Let me just get a picture. Shutter speed 750th. F5. 160 ISO. That really is a something and nothing picture, but it reminds me of something we need to do for next week's show, a location that we need to revisit. All will become clear a little bit later on in today's show. Right, we're starting out the traps this week uh, with a letter with, with, well, what the Australians would call a rip snorter or ripper of an idea, depending upon what decade you're living in, of course. It's a, a letter from John Baisley in Australia. Actually, you have to be... You have to be very careful with Australianisms, don't you? I had no idea for years that something as simple as the word root was so difficult to use every day in Australia without it causing mild offence to abject horror. For example, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say to the kids on sports day, kids, good luck with the races today. Be there for each other, yeah? Make sure you root for each other. Because here, and in many other parts of the world, uh, including America and Canada and so on, it, it, it's... <laughs> Root just means, you know, you support each other, you cheer each other on, but, I don't know, in, in Australia land, it means something entirely different that uh, little Johnny wouldn't or certainly couldn't be thinking about at primary school. And, and there's another problem. Johnny uh, is probably not the perfect word I should have chosen in, in uh, analogous um, harmony with the word root. Or the inflected verb version, rooting. And uh, there endeth the, uh, the English, or well, the Australian English lesson today. We have a a reasonable Australian following, so uh, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead to uh, save the embarrassment of parents who've enthused upon their children. It's okay to listen to this podcast on the school run because um, it doesn't swear like other podcasts. Though, um, just, just finally on the subject, I'd like you to imagine our kids' squeals of delight 
when we were in the premier state and they heard um, a Sydney morning breakfast show presenter three years ago described somebody as the, the W word in the morning quiz because they'd got the, <laughs> they'd got the answer wrong. Dad, did he just... No, no, no. No, darling, they're, they're doing the shipping forecast, the Australian one. They're just telling everybody, make sure you lay anchor today. That's it, lay anchor. No, nothing to see here. They're rooting for the ships, you see. Anyway, should we move on? Today you'll hear a few references to, um, to the sound of pictures. And you'll absolutely love an idea uh, coming up here. And I'm really excited to, uh, to share this. It's uh, from one of our patrons, John Baisley, who I am making today, patron of the day. I'm playing my ace card very early. I was never that good at cards. Uh, but a couple of weeks back, I, uh, I received a magazine in the post from Australia, from, from John, called um, The Boxer, the magazine. His uh, first self-published project of, uh, of this kind. And there's a, a very simple idea within it that literally had me draw my breath. And I'll share that in a moment. It made me sit upright with plans of my own, so it did. But John also sent a, a handwritten letter. I so love handwritten letters. I've been advised that there's one particular guest I'm, I'm really keen to, to speak to at the moment who really only reacts to handwritten letters. So um, handwritten letters go a long way. And it was a thrill to get John's. Um, he just ha he's just handed back his uh, paramedics uniform which he's had for years and years, and he's uh, put so much service into to that profession to pursue his dream of becoming now a full-time photographer. Uh, dear Neil, it's been a, a long time and a journey, this whole photography thing. Spent more money than I should have, taken many more poor photos, but um, that all takes me to where I am now. This magazine is a culmination of ideas and influences over the years with some ideas of my own. I hope you like it from John. So first up, The Boxer. Yes, it's a magazine, not a book, and this first edition is about one boxer in particular. Front cover, wonderful, super, grainy, motion, blurred. I mean, I might even say fierce in emotional terms, picture of a boxer. This, uh, this man called Sam, who is the, I suppose, is the main event. That's what you'd say in boxing, wouldn't you? Um, John writes as the foreword, I met Sam when he was promoting a, a local boxing event in Mount Gambia, South Australia in 2019, which is where John lives. I sent a brief message via social media asking if it would be OK to photograph the event that weekend. And that is where all this started, which is what I love about this project, John. Now, you saw something that you, you may have seen before, I don't know, an advert for boxing in your area. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but that's not the point here. But, but you thought, hmm... Oh, Maybe, maybe there's a picture or three in this and you just jumped right in. You felt the fear. You reached out to Sam, this, uh, who's a young, newly married man. He's an accountant by day and he's this, uh, he's this chap exploring um, becoming a, a pro boxer. And that's the start of photo projects, isn't it, really? You, you reach out, you make some pictures, you either think, yeah, that was fun, hmm, yeah, or it consumes the creative part of your, of your brain that turns the whole thing into a much longer study and, or dare I say, obsession, actually. A book or, a, in this case, magazine or, or your other idea, which is still coming up. So um, the pages, and I'll, I'll feature some pictures today on the show page, they're black and white pictures. They follow Sam through weigh-ins and uh, meeting up with his mates in the house, uh, the medical checks, paperwork, gloves, gloves being done up. You can see the emotion of people around him. Uh, we move through to the, the, the fight night and the fight itself, which goes all the way. Then right at the end, you have this, this tense right-hand page, picture page of the, of the referee holding both boxers' wrists, about to hold hold one up and you're looking at it thinking is it sam is it sam uh, but that is where this most fantastic idea surfaces as i was looking through the magazine next to these contrasty really gritty very close-up pictures and the focal length is effective i think you, you you use two cameras but mainly i think the fuji film x100 was it the v um so that's a effective 35 millimeter throughout and i came across though next to the pictures this is the bit some qr codes i thought well, why are the qr codes there because usually you look at a qr code and you think oh that might take me to a sales page or something but i i um i held my camera out my my smartphone camera 
popped it over the QR code, and bang, up came the sounds of the event. So John had published within his book QR codes that take you to his SoundCloud. It's where he hosts it. Could be a number of places, couldn't it? But he uses SoundCloud, his SoundCloud accounts. And you can, you can hear the, uh, the boxers talking, the excitement in the weighing uh, room or the training room um, or the weigh-in, isn't it? Not weighing, weigh-in room. Is it weigh-in or weighing? Uh, and you can hear all the chatter after the, the boxing bout itself. And I just thought, what a fantastic idea. You've brought your book to life. I mean, the pictures are fantastic, but you've brought your book to life with this just super idea and very simple idea of QR codes that link you to actually hearing the pictures. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to use the I word again, it's inspired. And if you think about the practical application in your books and magazines and even publicity and and business cards. Imagine the power of hearing the story just because you place your smartphone camera over the uh, over a QR code. That, you know, John, yes, you've up-leveled right from the off. Great idea for photographers globally. John is now working on his next project, uh, one with a, a former, former boxer, actually, who's now an ultra runner. These people are uh, unhinged. <laughs> Uh, is, that a P- is that a PC comment? I'm not quite sure. If it's not, I apologise. And uh, John himself is also an ultra runner and thinks nothing of suggesting to his wife, because they've recently done it, let's go on a 100-kilometre run. All right, darling. Which I'm sure is a much better habit to get into than mine. Darling, why don't we go for a lovely Indian meal? Oh, yes, please. So, yes, he's working with this old ultra runner called Adrian Bellin, who used to be a, a pro boxer in Australia, and he's recording conversations with him that may well appear in the, the next magazine project. And, uh, you know, usually we play only photo inspirational stories during this walk, don't we? Every, every so often you get minute and a half or two minutes of inspirational chat from a, a former guest, but um, I'd like to play a minute of Adrian talking about ultra running. What, Neil? What? You've gone off the beaten track? Well, for very good reason. I think what he says sounds like somebody talking about um, their positive obsession with anything, and in our case, photography. So if you swap the words ultra running for the word photography Uh, we put up a and i mentioned this a moment ago didn't i a lot of creative walls us creative kinds don't we we uh, that we can't do a certain kind of picture making because oh somebody else does it better or i don't know it's too hard Uh, or because we're too old or too late to the party too young don't fit the fashion to anything and i love adrian's i'll just make it up approach (laughs) that was really i'm sorry i don't want to i don't want to be a spoiler here he says it's so much better than me a third reason really this is the, the kind of thing that the sound coming up that you'll hear from john in his magazine qr code so the boxer project uses a different kind of this i'd say it's more atmos in the boxer but um this is it's like, like the sound of training in a gym as i said but this is these are actual words uh from i suppose from a portrait session and the last reason that I'm playing this instead of a photographer at the head of the show today, is uh, just, I want you to dive in, be consumed by an idea, then then think, how can I make this just a bit different? How can I add a different dimension to it? It's probably a better thing to say. So here's an excerpt of um, Adrian Bellin, ultra runner, talking to John Baisley, also (laughs) ultra runner. And I'll leave some links in the show notes today so you can see this magazine in full. And then when you get older, you, I don't know, you work, got kids, everything, life gets in the way and you sort of go, well, well what do I have? So I just made it up. I'm going to be an ultra runner because I wasn't meant to do it, if you know what I mean. I just made it up. With the uh, whole ultra running process, like I'm, you know, I'm, I just dove into it then. Like, you know, I'm always reading, watching stuff. I run every day virtually, train every day. You know, I'm right into it. And when I first started, I went, oh, I can't run that far. I'm just not built like a runner. I'm, I'm like a tank. I'm like, like a run, runners are like greyhounds. You know, they're just lean, fast, and they're, they're, that's the runner. I'm like a little bulldog, you know. <laughs> so and you soon find out quickly when you're doing the hundred milers that people come. It doesn't matter. Lives. The whole running community is like that. There's so many different people and different types of people that do it. And I was like, okay, how can sheep run hundred miles? You know what I mean? How can that person? That's crazy. Like, what's my excuse? 
You know what I mean? I'm making up excuses before I've even had a crack at doing it. I don't know. What's uh, David Goggins saying when he says, you know, if you're not that person, create the motherfucker who is? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's, it's true. Like, like oh, okay, I'm not that type of guy that can do that. But what if I make myself into it? Adrian Bellin talking to uh, John Baisley. Just make it up. Just make it up. Yeah. Just do it. But uh, that boxing bout, Neil, who won? Who won? Now, I didn't tell you, did I? Yeah, you took us that far. And then you didn't tell us what happened. Who's, whose hand went up? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, you can see it if you click on the links today that I'll put on the show page. You can see the entire magazine. If you want to uh, help John in the project by buying one, I think he said to me he'd only put something like $2 markup on it, $2 Australian dollar markup on it. So it's not something he's thinking about making lots of money from. And it's through Blurb, so I'm right in saying that you can get that anywhere in the world. He says, just with a slight wince in case I'm wrong in some areas. But, uh, oh, that's not a very good picture. Let's move past that. Dead rabbit. Oh, two dead rabbits. The Valley of the Dead Rabbits. Oh, dear. Poof, move on. Um, yeah, sorry about that, but I do like to share my entire walk with you. So you can go and see that, and um, it, if, if you open up the link, you'll see the book. There's a preview, and you can look through the entire book, and you'll see the idea with the QR codes and so on and so forth. Um, but I did ask uh, John why he printed this work and didn't do it simply as a web project. And he said, uh, well, I made a magazine because people tend to lend out magazines, which by a slight selfish angle means I get more exposure. By doing this one magazine, I've seen it handed around to other boxers, and I, or it, as a project, has gained far more engagement. Definitely more projects on the way, yeah. So, inspired already. Uh, John also added, because he's just turned professional, if it helps somebody else who's on the, the precipice of taking that final step to do what they're, they're called to do, absolutely do it. And I like this. Many choose photography, but photography chooses few. It's like a yogi's thoughts. So thank you, John. We haven't done this for a couple of weeks, but I wanted to give a shout out, as the youth say, for uh, the Photography Daily Facebook feed of members, which has some fascinating stuff on it at the moment. And I've taken one conversation from it for inclusion on the, the photo walker in a moment. One that uh, one about what makes the pictures, or us or the cameras we choose, which is, I think, a, a subject for, for debate. But uh, this week there are also pieces from uh, Kian Balak, who uh, has been making stuff that he finds out on his walks uh, in Scotland into a photographic still life. I, I love this. So he collects stuff, makes it into a still life, then photographs it. Inspiring. Kian says, um, last week I got told off for saying legacy all the time, didn't I? This week, I can, I can sense it now. Save your time. I'm going to say inspiring quite a lot. Uh, Kian says, I'm experimenting with still life. Is it os os uh, assemblages? Assemblages, isn't it, Rodney? Or is it as as assemblage? <laughs> I'm trying to make the word far more complex than it needs to be. Made from items that I've picked up while on my walks. It's, um, it's quite common to find sheep's wool caught in bushes and fences where I live. The sheep's mandibles are not so common. What's a mandible, Neil? Ah, the largest bone in a skull. That's what a mandible is. Uh, Kian says there was that actually a sheep's spinal column too, but I think it got ploughed back into the field. Maybe I'll have a whole reconstructed sheep in a few years. The tiny wasp's nest was uh, attached to my garage door, and along with the, the backing board, it represents me and my home as an integral part of the surrounding landscape. Oh, I mean, this, this is practically Tate Modern, Kian. No, it is. It's, it's Tate Modern. I loved what you did. And I was left thinking again, just as with John's QR codes, absolutely, stand by, inspired. Not to copy, necessarily, but to think about how I could apply that to uh, that kind of thinking to something I do. Maybe the masks art. Do you remember the masks thing? I haven't seen so many the last couple of weeks. I've not been, not been adding to my collection of pictures. Um, the masks on the floor and just just collecting pictures of them. But then I, I thought, probably not the best thing to actually physically collect, are they? Old masks. Not the best thing to do in a pandemic. Collecting masks to make art from. What have you got there? Masks. Get out the house. 
Um, there was a post also that I popped up following last week's uh, what I loosely called Megasode. It was long, wasn't it? Nearly one hour 40. So it was something about how long the photo walk episodes should be. Turns out that you voted the longer the better. I was uh, worried that uh, long episodes turn people off before they've even pressed play. But um, that is precisely the wrong way, it seems, to be planning a show because then you're giving yourself some kind of artificial limit. Or um, maybe not artificial, but imposed limit, like applying contrast to pictures. I'm going to go for 34% contrast always. Doesn't work like that, does it, when you're, when you're post-processing? <laughs> And then this from uh, Christopher O'Sullivan, who posted the following saying from the, the legendary Peter Adams. Photography is not about the cameras, the gadgets and the gizmos. Photography is about the photographer. A camera doesn't make great pictures any more than a typewriter makes a great novel. And um, I got to thinking about that. It's something that I have heard before, I've seen before. And I got to, to thinking about that. Is it important? So, but anyway, here, here are some of your thoughts addressing a great camera can't make a great photograph any more than a great typewriter can write a great novel. Paul Rawson said, uh, you can still take a bad photo with a good system, but just like a fountain pen might improve somebody's handwriting, a good camera system will still improve the overall image quality and the scope of what you want to do. You can compose a great photo with a cheap camera, but you won't necessarily get the same colour rendition. Sharp edges, depth of field, focal length, shutter speed, and so on. And then Robin Edwards said, oh, by the way, Robin, you are spot on with this answer. I hadn't thought of it this way. This is, he says, a false analogy, says Robin. A writer can write without any tools. A photographer, though, needs a camera, just as a chisel is part of the wood sculptor's tools. The choice of chisel dictates the outcome of the sculpture. The person who designs the camera and what it can do is part of the process. It's a collaboration. For the pedants, I guess, the writer does need something. <laughs> Just in case you say, oh, Robin wasn't exactly right there. Yes, flint on rock, but I, but I get what you mean broadly. Yes, very much. Brian Taylor backs this thought up with, the statement is true in a way, and in some ways, mm, no. The photographer's eye is what frames and composes the image. There's a reason that blockbuster films are not shot on iPhones. At a certain point, there's a quality threshold that can only be crossed with the right gear. But let's be clear, a great photographer can shoot a great shot on a potato. I guess the potato is a pinhole here, yeah? And a poor photographer can shoot horrible images on a 30 grand camera. It's a partnership. There are some other thoughts on, uh, on there from uh, our fantastic members of the group, but um, I got to thinking about uh, our gear, our cameras and what we can do. And it's, it's a very instilling thing we do with a camera isn't it whether it, whether it's the camera that makes great work or the photographer and I, I got to thinking about the photographers who tell stories so well and so instinctively with um, with whatever they use where it truly is a partnership and um, episode six comes very much to mind I'd like to play you a few words from episode six when I spoke with Jim Mortram he's had uh, well, various cameras but uh, here's what for him is intrinsically important about making the picture. In life, you're always, one supposes, searching for that thing that's your thing, right? I mean, I'd, I'd been to art school, I'd painted, I loved it. A lot of ego involved in, in that. I played in bands for a long time, made music. A lot of ego involved in that. Photography, I love principally for the instructions are so simple with a, with, with a traditional camera, okay? The lens points one way, you're the other side of that lens and it's pointing out from you. It's one of the rare art forms, if it is an art form, that has that kind of built-in instruction to it where you're shooting out. It's out from the self. And that's really, really important to me. I don't, we can be, sometimes we can all get trapped in introspection and, and Everything's always about us. And the thing that I love about photography is it gives me the opportunity to do the opposite of that. You know, I'm, I'm always looking out. I'm looking out at other people. Do you ever feel like you want to say hallelujah uh, out loud, even if you're listening to this right now with your headphones on and you're in a built-up area? That's Jim Mortram from way back... From way back when, episode six, Sean Tucker on his YouTube channel produced a great film about uh, Jim recently. So, uh, so Jim's obviously been on my mind. That seemed an appropriate place to uh, talking about what makes uh, what makes the picture, the photographer or the camera, and uh, the sort of 
what intrinsically makes a picture for somebody. That seemed a great time to to bring Jim in. There's, uh, oh, this is, I must come back here. Collectors collect berries. Neil, don't start collecting wild berries unless you're out for a walk with next week's guest. He'll know what he's picking and what he's eating. But they are, they're blackberries, aren't they? Not schnoozeberries. What were schnoozeberries from? What were schnoozeberries from? That was an Enid Blyton book, wasn't it? Let me take a picture. I'll post them up and you can say to me, yeah, Neil, you could have had those. There we go. I have a feeling I'm making scrapbook images this week. I've not really thought long and hard about my compositions today. A lot of the time I don't. When I'm walking with you, I mean, the idea of the photo walk is that uh, we both take our cameras, make some pictures while we're chatting and uh, listening to and reading the letters that, uh, and DMs that have been sent in. This is quite a nice vista, actually, but I've not got the right sort of camera for that. When I'm on, a, on an X100V, uh, 23mm lens, so that's effective focal length, 35 and I've got this really wide, I mean, this, I suppose I could take a panoramic, but they never really show that well on the, on the show page. See if I can get... I had a problem with it earlier, actually, this camera. For some reason, exposure compensation. Uh, whatever way I, I, I wheeled, it was just going up and up and up. I ended up looking like I was taking pictures on the sun. Uh, right, where are we? It's quite bright. There's fields upon fields here. I'm at the top, and I'm very close, actually, to a mast, a radio mast, which I think we'll, we'll find on our walk in a moment. It's, I think, one of the most powerful masts in the south in the UK. Oh, the focus is hunting. You can probably hear it. Here we go, F5, shutter speed 1700, ISO 160. There we go. The valley, the valley I'm in. Um, right, Simon Tivoli in Perth. It's the Australian Flavour Week, it would seem, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with that. Great to hear from you again, Simon. Hi, Neil. Simon from Perth, the finest city in Australia. That's the way you st start all your mails to me. I think I'm getting the idea, Simon, yes. Rumour has it you're visiting us sometime soon when the nasty C word lets you come across. Uh, can I suggest a visit to this side of our country instead of just Sydney? I know I always talk about going back to Sydney. It's because I loved it. I really enjoyed my time there. And we went up the East Coast. Um, well, flew up to Cairns as well. Um, but yeah, I know I talk a lot about Sydney and I really felt, I did, I, I felt a real tug as I was leaving. It was kind of like, no, don't go, stay. I, I, honestly, of all the places I've visited in my life, leaving Australia was tough. It really was tough. I remember looking down as the, the plane sort of did a, almost like it did that, the same circle that um, Obama's helicopter uh, when, when he left the presidency, I think they, they circled one more time and there's that fantastic picture, incredibly potent picture of, of President Obama, made by Pete Souza, who shows the, the former president looking down at the White House thinking, what's about to happen? And I, I think, I think our, our big Airbus, the old big 380, bird in the sky, did another lap of honour, I think. I'm pretty sure he did because I kind of I looked out the window and thought oh oh yeah, it was but uh, but yes I do realize there are there are other cities but um, but uh, but Sydney so uh, yes can I suggest uh, this part of the country instead of just Sydney I promise a cold beer awaits and the best weather all year round I still don't quite get the idea of your Garibaldi I thought you were referring to a friend of yours called Gary who, like you, no offence, has a reflector as a head. Do you know that's the amazing thing about Australians? They say it as it is, don't they? Which is probably why I enjoyed it so much. The banter was fantastic. I loved it. Yes, so it only occurred to me that when you suggested dipping your Gary Baldy into a coffee, that it couldn't possibly be one of your mates. Even for an Englishman, that's a bit strange. So now I find out that they're biscuits. And my wife says, she's sure she's seen them in Coles. That's a tongue twister. She's sure she's she, seen them. She's she sure she's seen them in Coles. As for last week's show, where you suggested a country called Photographia, as this is a new idea, I'd like to suggest a place in the world that this land can exist. Uh, as you're expecting me to say, I'm going to suggest just off the coast of Perth. Tassie off Melbourne, Tiwi's off Darwin, there's a vacancy for a new island in Western Australia. So tow it out here and we can discuss the details of what the flag looks like. Now I like that, I like that idea a lot. And in case you're thinking, what on earth are they talking about? Last week on the show, if you missed that one, I was talking, I just got this idea, this sort of imaginary, I think it's inspired by a friend of mine who's on the radio, but this imaginary 
Um, oh, no public right of way, but I want to go that way. Ooh, really? Okay. Uh, well, there's nothing... Oh, okay, all right. Head back this way. I want to, I want to try and take you around to where the... Um, I want to get a picture of the... Sorry, I'm digressing, aren't I? Um, I want to get a picture of this really tall huge radio mast it's a really important one in the uk anyway i'll have to go this way uh so yeah so we were talking about this this um eccentric idea of having having a a country that exists just for photographers we came up with the uh the idea of photographia but um remember this can't be i mean yeah we could take it out to australia i'd like it out there and perth does look nice it's got yeah, good all-round all weather, isn't it? All year-round weather. But uh, it's not part of Australia. This is a republic, just to remind you, Simon. And uh, I've also renamed the island. I, I, I kind of like the idea of photography, but then I thought, oh, it sounds like, a, sounds like a big camera store, doesn't it? Come to Photographia. There probably is a Photographia somewhere in the world. If you look it up on Google, I bet there is. So I've renamed it, and I've called it... Um, I've had a vote, <laughs> me and Carr. And we return the name Bacasia. 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 You better get it right, Neil, if it's, if it's the new name. Well, it's, ba it's based on... Because everybody says it's a different way. This could be a bad idea from the outset, couldn't it? Do you say bokeh or boca? It's pronounced so many different ways. Bacasia. That's what we're going to call this place. Bacasia, where life is judged by how out of focus the background is. The entire population... I had to note this down living on a diet of 99% proof moonshine, served every night in golden hour, called Flash Lash. I thought that could, be the, that could be the drink of the island, Flash Lash, which it can also double as the nation's supply of, um, of extra strong fixer. The national produce of uh, Bacasia is uh, cheap knockoff cameras, obviously. Best-selling export is the Leica L10, known for its awful weather ceiling, where somebody in marketing, during golden hour, after two glasses of Flash Lash, accidentally ordered the, uh, the wrong-shaped sticky dot. You know what's coming up now, meaning that they still have 49,732 red squares to be used up. And I've made the capital Aramac. Think about that. Aramac? No? Reverse spelling of we know, Neil. We'd worked it out before you said it. We're not daft. So, uh, Bacasia, that's, uh, that's the official name now. We'll have a, a national anthem, I'm sure, <laughs> at some stage. One of you lot must be very good at uh, the keyboard. Can't you make me a, can you make me a national anthem for Bacasia? I know it's a bit daft and eccentric, but it's over you, to you now to help, to, help, to help stand by, to help develop, do you see what I did there, uh, this idea. But um, si Simon from Perth has said we, we're to have this island just off the coast of Perth. So that's, that's where it is. Bang. I know it's a long journey, but it'll be worth it. You get there, the flash lash, <laughs> it'll make you completely forget any idea of having a journey out there in the first place. Right, enough of this nonsense. Let's see where you've been photographing this week. Here's one from Jens Roda and a slight change of feeling to light and shade, highlights and shadows. So good to hear from you, Jens. To, to quote John Lennon, Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And uh, boy, has life thrown a spanner or two in the machine here at Rotor HQ. So as of late, I've not been walking while listening, but have uh, instead enjoyed the podcast in my car, driving back and forth to my, to my mum's house. My dad uh, passed away a couple of months ago, and I'm really sorry to hear about that. Jens, really, uh, really am. After 10 years with Parkinson's disease, so... I've been helping my mum with all kind of practical stuff like bank and probate, court and so forth. And of course, trying to process the loss of my father on the side too. So not many opportunities to take our, our time to other ph photography projects beside the, the photo ping pong. Do you remember we talked about that earlier during the year? Uh, that still hums along. I've started to regard that as a sort of a, a half 365 but now things are starting to settle, so there's been a bit more time to, to photograph. So this week, I could say check to boots on, lens cap off, and so forth. For my walk, I was once again somewhere around the lake. Is it Lake Mosso? Lake Mosso uh, in Denmark, in brackets, land. Everything's, everything's now become land at the end. Uh, Australia land, Denmark land. Uh, an area that's close by where I live that I, that I enjoy visiting. It's easy to find spots where you are all by yourself. Ah, oh, Jens, that sounds absolutely perfect. Spot on to me. 
Uh, the fact that it's also a very nice looking piece of nature, well, that does also count on the positive side of the balance sheet. This day, there was almost no wind, touch of Indian summer in the temperatures, and I did remember to pack coffee and a piece of cake. It was a very welcome time to enjoy nature, the podcast, and finally also a bit of time to, to reflect. I tend to forget that when I'm busy solving other people's problems. Yes, that's what these, that's what these photo walks do, and that's why um, I know sometimes I... I, I <laughs> Not, I don't really worry. Worry is too strong a word, but I'm, I'm going to use it. I worry that when I say, oh, I've got to meet people. I don't want to meet people while I'm out walking. I'm, I must sound like a miserable, you know, miserable person. I'm just, but no, not at all. I think, I, I think these are the moments I think, yeah, no, these are perfect. These are the moments I need. And I, and I suspect, obviously, with the way that you've been feeling uh, right now, being able to get out there and photograph, perfect escapism. Now, I've got... Um, a line of, um, and I didn't walk underneath them. I was going to walk underneath them, but they they make so much uh, noise. I was worried about it getting onto the the microphone. The hum you get from these these ele- electric pylons that um, dissect through the landscape. And I, I once asked somebody who was in the business, "Why can't you put those all underground?" Um, it was a lot to do with cost and the fact that we'd we'd all go broke overnight. Ah. What's new? But there's a pile on there, and sometimes the way they dissect through countryside, uh, it might look ugly, but they're quite, they're quite in, make quite interesting photographs. Juxtaposition. Let me see if I can get one. Hold on. It might be a little bit too far away, but I think a silhouette will work with these angry clouds. I'm gonna go F8 because I've underexposed by such a lot. Now the shutter speed has come up, 2400. Uh, with an ISO of 160. I mean, I could put a neutral de- density filter on, which is one of the advantages, of course, of using the X100V, but I, but I haven't. Um, here we go. So, anyway, thank you, Jens. Thank you very much for your, your email. And it's time to do a bit of uh, listening together now, I think, for a moment. I've, I've split today's chat into, into two chapters with my guests, both of which you'll hear today, chapter one and two, to sort of balance our conversation between photo walk and, and guests now. And I tell you what, there are some real gems from today's guest, Simon Buckley from Manchester, UK, or actually from Salford, near Manchester, UK, who is in every way an artist, a photographer, a short filmmaker, a, a writer, a sound recordist, a broadcaster, a podcaster, He's, um, and he's worked as a professional photographer for over three decades. And you know, we're going to talk about one, one project, just one project of his today. Though I, I am hoping he'll return to talk about his, his travel work and a little more about his architectural work and his, his amazing iPhone stories. But today I want to talk about a project called Not Quite Light. Stand by for the inspired word again. What a great title. Um, the pictures are made in the quite literal, as you'll hear, dead of night, or, or very, very early morning, or when the light is trailing off, because there's a, there's a magic to making pictures in the solitude of darkness, it would seem. Uh, Not Quite Light uh, is a project I, I will link to, of course, and I know some of what you'll hear Simon say today, some of the things that he says, will, uh, well, I think they're gonna draw a kind of, oh, yes, he's right, uh, reaction. Not Quite Light by Simon Buckley. Here's our conversation, chapter one. Simon, you live in Salford, which is home now to BBC Media City. I mean, that part of the city has changed somewhat. And for somebody who, quote, explores themes of transition frequently within the urban environment, it's almost like they provided you with a touch more of your, your very own, uh, on your right on your doorstep, just where you need it most. Yeah, Ed, Salford is a fascinating city. My kids grew up there and... It's not Manchester, and quite particularly so. I think a lot of people, you know, understandably to a degree, lump the two cities together, they do, but they have yeah, a very different yeah. quality to them. And Manchester's decisions around its regeneration and its heritage are different to Salford's. But Salford really did need something. It's not particularly got one centre or one heart. It's got several hearts, like other European cities, I suppose. You know, you couldn't actually name the centre of it. And so it's a really wonderful time to live through, to be able to watch 
the transition of Salford and also compare it to the yeah. uh, decisions of the Manchester City Council and how they've proceeded with regeneration in a post-industrial era. Well, what, what is it that originally fascinated you about transition and, and, and the way these cities and places change? Maybe not just as a photographer, but also as somebody with a just a genuine interest of what's going on on their doorstep, Simon. Well, I think if you are going to be a successful photographer, actually, in a way, the taking of the photograph is the end part. Of the, it sounds like an obvious thing to be the end part of the process. Actually, you know, when you press the shutter, you are the sum total of all your experience and knowledge in that moment. And so actually, uh, in particular, with not quite light, the um, themes of transition came from an emotional place. I'd uh, come to the end of a very long uh, relationship and it was very painful. And I was living in the centre of town and we were, me and the guy who was, whose flat I was sharing, we used to walk the city streets at night around the old parts of Manchester. And so not quite light emerged from a time of my own transition. And I think, mm. therefore, I was probably very curious about those themes. But also the city, as I say, has been going through tremendous transition for years. And when I was standing in Angel Meadow, which is a place just off the city centre where 40,000 people were buried, it's a mass burial ground, yeah. I was just watching this light um, land from a very big modern building onto these gravestones that are there. And just a very simple question formed, you know, what would these souls think of the city we've created? And of course, I was thinking, what would my soul think of my future as well? Because yeah. I was about to um, enter a life which I couldn't yet imagine. Well, your, your work is driven by, by and through the half-light. And and before before the light comes up and, and when we're saying goodnight, you find yourself in forests and along towpaths and and streets where where nobody else is around i can see the time the, the time stamps on your project show this northwestern street 3 13 a.m angel meadow 4 36 a.m what what is it about that time of of day or night that that makes your photography and projects the, the, come alive the city is the city is suspended in a and a kind of tension between night and day there. Yeah. It's like a magical place. Um, you sense a different energy about the city. Often in the very early starts, anybody that's out on the streets doesn't really want to be there, and so they have a story to tell. And I feel um, a kinship with that, I suppose. Um, it's also absolutely fascinating to me to see the city emptied of people when lockdown happened, for instance, and everybody was like aghast at the way in which the city looked. To me, it looked quite normal <laughs> because that's how I often <laughs> see the city streets completely empty. It wasn't something that surprised me. And it gives the buildings uh, the opportunity to be themselves in a way, stripped of human beings poking around them and making decisions about them. These structures, which will last way beyond our lifetimes in some cases other times not the, the drop after 20 or 30 years but it gives them the chance to be able to have their own personality for them to own the streets uh, for them to really cause us to understand the decisions made i think with clarity because human beings create chaos and mess around them and uh, once the streets are empty i think you'd be able you're able to see the quality of the buildings and i just love being on my own actually out in the morning yeah, it's, i always feel quite annoyed when the sun's up and i and the, and the <laughs> lights go off and the magic ends but you must meet people i know you do because you've commented on some of your pieces about the people that you meet do you talk to them i mean there, there's probably some sort of temptation to to turn this into almost a street photography project sometimes. Well, I am talking to somebody at the moment who's asked me why I'm not for perhaps doing uh, portraits of residents, you know, perhaps to get the stories of the people that live in the areas. Yeah, yeah. And I am thinking about that because I used to be a, you know, when I was working for the Saturday Telegraph magazine or L magazine, I was very much a portrait and documentary photographer. And I am considering this. But um, I think really at the moment, it's more that when I meet people, we just talk you know and i think it's part of the stories that i write rather than me feeling the need to photograph them i'm not there to capture mm. um people i'm there to capture the essence of the city in a way which which will endure beyond the lifetimes of the citizens to a degree i think um but yeah i have had some really interesting encounters and uh, one in particular that was a bit dangerous uh, earlier this year which is my kind of first bad moment in six years but the ones which have been really sweet like i always uh, tell the anecdote of when i was on a, a old mill street which is just 
uh, near Ancoats, just off the city centre in Manchester. I think it was May, around about 4, 4.15 in the morning. And it's a long, straight road that comes off um, the, the inner ring road. And I could see this woman, probably in the mid-60s or older, just shuffling towards me with a little shopping trolley-type stroller thing. And I was standing next to my tripod near a pharmacy, and there were some concrete bits of seating. And she came to a halt there, and it seemed absurd, given that we were the only two people on the street and 20 feet away from me, so yeah. not to say good morning to her. And I said, so what, what? how come you're here? And she said, well, I've just finished my night shift, and I've missed my bus, so I have to walk home. It's about two miles, she said. And I remember thinking, that's going to take you ages speed, you're walking. And I kind of felt how awful it is that after working all night, she also had to walk home. Anyway, she stood up and uh, set off on a journey again, and I went back to my tripod, and I looked up a few moments later, and I swear she did disappeared and I to this day have no idea where she went because it's a long straight road and at the speed she was walking she couldn't have turned off it and it almost felt as if I'd perhaps talked to an apparition and uh, although I'm sure there's a very conventional answer to it moments like that appeal to me because in a way you engage with that childlike magic the potential that strange things can happen and it takes you out of your adult self a little bit it returns you to that belief that something extraordinary is around the corner that we are all on the threshold of a portal oh and, yeah um, and, and equally i mean i see you in the woods for me that <laughs> i've got an over active imagination and look you're a photographer you're a creative you've probably got a similar kind of overactive imagination yeah. well that that project that you're talking about was for the barnaby festival and ended up becoming um a quite a significant project in my life actually it ended uh, it should have been a six-month project and became almost 18 months by the time I finished um, it this June. And the, I remember very vividly the first time I went to the forest, having <laughs> volunteered to do this, I, <laughs> I conceived and created the project. And I remember sitting in my car and I could hear this owl hooting and uh, <laughs> and the wind was kind of starting to, to whip up. And, you know, it has a very ghostly it does. Uh, sound yeah. when it comes through yeah. the branches. Yeah. And again, I remember thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, and it really caused me to feel confronted. But actually, it's absurd when you think about it, because all that was at work there were the fairy tales of childhood of Hansel and Gretel. But I, I live in Salford and arguably a million times more dangerous than uh, Macclesfield Forest, which has got virtually no threat at all. There are no bears or lions or wild cats. All I had to do was overcome my imagination. On the security front, and I, d- I don't want to labour this point, but there's being, and you, you, you did sort of make a glancing reference to uh, one particular moment that you had that was a bit more awkward earlier this year, but does being out on your own with a camera at these times in quite parts of the city and this this can be north east south west wherever um anywhere in the world does does that bring its own logistics problems such as security and safety for you and and your kit simon yeah well it does in a way i mean at the end of the day it's just a camera and you know i thought the insurance would cover it but um I do work very simply. I just have a simple Nikon D850. I have one lens. It's a 2470 and um, a tripod. And so I don't, I I also have an LED light, which I occasionally wave about to uh, fill in uh, light a little bit, but I do travel very simply. You know, I have a few filters in my bag for ND filters to to kind of sometimes balance the sky and the foreground, but there isn't a lot uh, to attract attention. But the occasion I I, I, uh, referred to in March was where somebody recruited a couple of rough sleepers and they they charged at me and uh, I think he was paranoid and at first I thought I was going to get stabbed but he just wanted to shout really loudly for about 10 minutes and frighten me I think get rid of his own demons and it was really unnerving and it did cause me to finish working for some time actually just because you know you do begin to consider your your safety but I have to say if I was doing this based on statistics I've been doing this now since I think January 2015 and that's the only time I've genuinely been Mm. in trouble in a Mm. way and the only other time was when there was some guy on a moped uh, buzzing me uh, in Salford that was I actually think what was at work there is he wanted to do some deal or something and he wanted me to disappear he didn't want to harm me he just didn't want me near him kind of right. thing you know and he was waiting right. for me to go so actually statistically it'd say it's quite safe mm. and at 4 or four thirty in the morning even the criminals often seem to be in bed you know it <laughs> seems to be kind of a very peaceful time then yeah. you know I do look over my shoulder a lot and I have my ritual as in I kind of keep my car quite close to me so that i can get in quickly and i have a basic movement that i can take the sd card out i've always dumped everything on it so that all i would lose was that morning's work and at the end of the day i always have to be sanguine and go if i lose my camera i need to stay safe Mm. and uh, a camera is replaceable the pictures for not quite light are a a real mix of camera and iphone um iphone 6 in particular now i know you don't use the iphone 6 anymore but 
what I would class as the signature image of, of this series is from an iPhone 6. And when I found that, I was, um, I was aghast, actually. I thought this cannot be. He must have written this incorrectly. That can't be an iPhone 6. The rainstorm picture, you mean? Yeah, the rainstorm, which is a glorious picture. It's in a way, it kind of, it's not really not quite like that. That was, I mean, I use my iPhone as a sketchbook, I suppose, is the closest way to the analogy I can use. It's obviously not as good as a DSLR in terms of the quality, although it's increasing yeah. hugely with each year. But I, I do sort of use it in a very much more informal way. And I kind of feel when I go out with my DSLR that ultimately it's like a 5.4 camera in my head. I've still got that cover over my yeah. over my scalp and I'm still bent forward and I've still only got three dark slides to get it right with. So I, I do think differently when I have the iPhone and the camera. But the uh, yeah, so the rainstorm thing was a very strange experience for me and really... It's much more like the work I used to do back in, say, the 90s and the 2000s when I was working for magazines in London. And and I sort of, in a way, have emotionally separated out from that picture. And it's got its own website now. And I sort of see that much more as a perhaps something that uh, I can sell commercially because people really like it. It's a bit like having a one-hit wonder. It feels a bit like, you know, being <laughs> Gary Newman being asked to play cars all the time when you've <laughs> carried, gone on and created albums for the next 40 years. So it's it's been a very light, I mean, it has been a life-changing experience uh, taking that picture, but it has happened very quickly i was standing on a tram station uh due to meet somebody to do some filming for an architectural project and the heavens opened as they can over here and rain was bouncing off the pavements but i was looking to my left and i thought actually that light is really quite sweet it's really yeah. very beautiful yeah. and um persuaded myself to set off into the storm and uh, found myself a position and I, I think it's really interesting how fast things can be framed up when you're when you're holding in this you know when you're holding the camera in front of your face and looking at a screen it's a very different relationship to the to the picture than putting your eye through a viewfinder mm. um, and very quickly the picture formed for me all the perspectives and everything and I, and I got five frames I think it was before the water stopped the screen from from working and I went back on the station looked at it scrabbled about very briefly and a lot of people said oh it's massively filtered actually of all the pictures I've taken probably one of the least processed I've <laughs> I, I have I used a bit of snapseed on it and then hesitated thought ah oh, there's a figure there like millimeters not in the right place I'm quite particular about my compositions I was a bit irritated by one figure and also it's a cliche you know it's like Manchester in the rain and so I nearly didn't post it but then I did and it went it went wild you know yeah. it's it's been life-changing but in terms of using an iPhone I, I, I carry it around with me as I say because it's lighter on my back and it's a simple sketchbook and I just use it to kind of keep Twitter moving on and things but it isn't really the same as as the actual project when I'm out of dawn with my tripod and I'm considered and I've researched and I've gone to a place and I'll write text about it. It's in intriguing, isn't it, the amount of photographers, I speak to quite a few now, that aren't afraid to admit that they've made a, a picture that has made a difference to their lives on a smartphone. It, it has changed other photographers' lives. Yeah, I mean, I always think back to Bert Hardy talking when he, when I think he, when he was working for Picture Post and he took a picture on a box brownie uh, to illustrate that it's the, it's the photographer, not the camera. And yeah. I do think there is a, a lot to that. I mean, Rich Richard Avedon used to work with Polaroids and used to get very excited working with that. You know, as I say, in a way, the best camera is your heart and your mind. If you can remember and feel, then actually you don't need a camera. You can keep it all in your head and then it's about how you share it with people. Well, you might do that through the form of storytelling or, or writing. So actually, you know, there's an internal camera within us all. If I go out with my iPhone, you know, I don't see that as a as, as, a, as a kind of compromise or, or, or compromising what I do as, a, as, a, as an artist at all. I just think it's a different way of sharing with people that which I encounter you know I, I you know we wander the streets and there are these constant collisions of coincidence around us and if you engage with them you know your life is enriched you know it's yeah. it's one of the greatest gifts on earth to be an observer you know because you see the minutiae of life and you're never bored you know you come home every night or every morning enriched by that which you've encountered Simon Buckley will return to the show soon for chapter two, we wander the streets and there are these constant collisions of coincidence around us. Oh, tell me that is not one of the most inspiring things you have heard today. Does that sound right? Um, my English teacher would not have been proud, proud with that, would he? Mind you, he used to throw bald rubbers at me. Do you remember the, uh, the big... Um, oh, hang on, gate. Do you remember the, the big block board erasers as they're properly called these days remember those S small bricks really weren't they uh, really hurt if he caught you so i don't care what he says um what was something else that simon mentioned 
Uh, it's one of the greatest gifts on earth to be an observer, yes. It gets better and better and better, as a football commentator once said. Answers on a postcard, if you, if you remember which one. You come back enriched by that you've encountered. Oh, so I'm looking forward to a chapter two of uh, Simon Buckley soon. Next week, by the way, another Simon. <laughs> We've gone Simon mad. Simon Baxter. Now, Simon had uh, an unfortunate accident on a mountain bike that led to his life entirely changing and the arrival of a, a beautiful dog called Meg, who became Simon's reason for becoming one of the most incredible nemophilists. Uh, what, Neil, is a nemophilist? Well, I'll tell you. Somebody who loves woodland. Actually, they're, they're said to, uh, in, in old speak uh, term, um, haunt the woodland. But Simon doesn't do that. He photographs the woodland and he makes the most beautiful pictures that uh, remind us that, that uh, mystery and, and beauty is right on our doorstep. And uh, I can't wait to bring you Simon next week. The two Simons <laughs> across these two weeks. Um, a tinsy bit of show news, if you don't mind. The 365 is going very well, the Community 365. Some cracking images again this week. There's a, a new photo essay up called uh, Inner Secrets 2 by uh, Michael Dries, uh, which you can find on the website, photographydaily.show. And I'm really proud that you, you're sort of taking ownership of the, of the website, really. You are, you, are, you are the daily in Photography Daily. You really are. And uh, Cara Gard's um, Little Mermaid statue picture taken on an iPhone on his daily run against the backdrop of a, a wonderfully low morning sun rising behind really dramatic clouds was a... Well, that was a Super 365 highlight this week, but in fact we've had... I uh, shouldn't really just draw one out because we've had some fabulous pictures this week. So uh, you do need to go to the website because... Um, hang on... <laughs> I'm trying a Simon Buckley quote on for size now. You'll be enriched by what you encounter. And if you'd like to join in with that, or indeed support the show for the, for the price of a cup of coffee a month on our Patreon, where you get the extra more show on a Saturday. So if you're listening to this on the right day, that'll be tomorrow. You can go to photographydaily.show and you'll find the link to um, our Patreon. Uh, and tomorrow, by the way, <laughs> tomorrow's more uh, over on Patreon, which is a which is, uh, I think, a great app also for your, uh, your iPhone or smartphone because um, there's another player on there, really, for all the, all the, all the private stuff that we have. And, and um, I'm going to start putting some pictures up there soon as well. And, and uh, now and then we, we put some guides to websites and stuff to, to, to go check out. But on uh, tomorrow's Patreon, on the, on the More Show, uh, we're going to talk about something you may or may not already know about. To me... Well, NF, if I say NFTs, what will you say? Will your eyes raise to the ceiling and think, oh, no, not somebody else talking about NFTs. Come on then, Neil. Are they going to make me a zillionaire? A non... F is it fungible? It is fungible. Yes, it is fungible token. Um, that's, what it, that's what it stands for, NFT. NFT, non-fungible token. It's a standby. A unit of data stored on a digital ledger called a blockchain that certifies a digital asset to be unique and therefore not interchangeable. NFTs can be used to represent items such as photos, videos, audio and other types of digital files. And whilst you may have lost the will with uh, those words, I have to say that there's, uh, make no mistake, there's, there's people making money out of them. So I've... <laughs> I've written a short essay on it, which is available to our, our patrons tomorrow. Our book club is, um, well, I'm going to bookmark Leaving and Waving, which I've finally gotten hold of. And uh, Simon Buckley has, uh, well, he talks about feeling instincts and keeping creativity alive. An additional minute or two following our interview that we recorded. But uh, the NFT thing, I thought the only way I'm going to understand NFTs, because I think I should understand them, because they affect our world, is to actually... <laughs> try and teach you about them now if you know about them already and it's it's old news bear with me and if you're a patreon member and you know about them already just send me a correction all right uh, i'm more than open <laughs> uh right back to your mouse then one of our biggest downloads of the podcast ever happened um a few wednesdays ago and it yielded more than a few mails and messages which uh some of which i've, I've read out now and a very potent one last week of course 
and a few that uh, remain private too. And uh, thank you for, for those messages. It was about the photographic uh, charity, Remember My Baby, RMB. Nikki Heppenstall appeared um, as co-founder of the charity in episode 257. So it was only a couple of weeks ago. And it was a special all of its own on a Wednesday. And it's, um, well, the, the charity provides free pictures for parents who've lost their child before, during or after birth. And I'll make no apologies for, um, for mentioning it a, f- a few weeks in a row now because I know Nikki has been thrilled to hear from some of our listeners who'd like to become involved in this, uh, this truly impressive and really important photographic charity. But I wanted to read a message from Nikki, which is about being a, an introvert, which broadly speaking is a strong theme of next week's photo walk show. Hi, Neil. I'm gradually listening to earlier podcasts and was interested to hear Sean Tucker talk about introvert and extrovert and being one. I am an introvert. I need solitude. And whilst I dislike being front and centre, I can manage it as long as I don't have to have to do it too often. If somebody said to me 15 years ago that I'd be delivering training to a dozen or more people with PowerPoint or talking to Jeremy Vine on Radio 2... From my local town studio, not in person, uh, terrifying nonetheless, for nine minutes, or addressing 230 people at an awards dinner, accepting an award, I'd have said, oh, no way. We're back also to this week's Feel the Fear statement made right at the start of the show, aren't we? I've overcome, says uh, Nikki, personal challenges to, to further RMB, public speaking and hospital phobia, childhood trauma in brackets, because RMB as a whole, for the families that we serve, is a much higher priority than me. And that comes back to other conversations we've had about making photographs that, that make a difference to other people. And that's one of the joys, one of the fantastic things about photography, isn't it? Being able to provide... What's that on the floor? What is that? Wow. Okay. Amazing what you find littered, isn't it? That looks like an EpiPen. Why would somebody leave an EpiPen? There was a period of time where you couldn't find those for love nor money in this country only months ago. Sorry, I'd, again, it's one of, my, one, of my, one of my foibles, isn't it? So, yeah, the difference that we can make as photographers to people, the things that we can do for other people... I think uh, is one of the most extraordinary things about being a photographer. And I'm sure <laughs> Simon is about to agree with that in the second chapter of uh, his particular chat today. I never thought, says Nicky, I'd be sat at a midwife's station with a cuppa, waiting for a family, being ready in hospital, when I lost my girl, Kim, 20 years ago. Kim's legacy, um, the L word, says Nicky in brackets, um, is pretty awesome. Yes, I'll allow awesome to go through for this particular conversation yeah, because it is. Let's play, a, I think, let's play a perfect moment uh, from that uh, chat with, uh, with Nikki uh, when we, we talked about the charity RMB a couple of weeks ago. I can't imagine not having my images. I just can't imagine that. Yeah. I don't have my baby. I don't have the memories that I could have captured, that I have captured with my other children. I don't look at them very often, but when I do, mm. I can remember the, the midwife being so kind who took footprints and handprints and a lock of hair. And I actually, I actually took a video camera in and I filmed that over her shoulder. And I remember smiling to myself because back then, this was 20 years ago, so back then it was a black ink pad just like you'd use in an office yeah. now they have special wipes and special paper so they apply the wipe to the baby's hands and feet carefully apply the baby's hands and feet one at a time to the paper and then whatever that is in the in the wipes develops on that special paper so now the baby's hands and feet are clean <laughs> they yeah. look clean they yeah. look, but my you know my baby's hands and feet were covered in black ink at the time um, but i remember smiling behind the video camera when the midwife was making those hand and footprints and that lock of hair. And that's a, that's a warm memory for me. That's a positive memory for me. Thank you for your, um, your public and your, uh, your private messages following uh, that show. And thank you again to, to Nikki for taking part in it. Right, your mails and the walks that you've been making. I'm getting closer to this transmitter, by the way. It's absolutely vast. It really is. 
probably cook your breakfast on that, couldn't you? From two miles away. Uh, right, your mails and walks. This next section of the show before we uh, before we check in with Simon, I'm going I'm to call it a tale of two Dennises. And you can see their work, their fantastic work on the the show pages today. Well, you can well it's it's kind of yeah one of the, one of them's more about one of them's more sort of a subject or a topic, and the other one is uh, uh, just a sublime photo walk. As always, from Dennis Skyam in Denmark land. Denmark and Australia have featured a lot this week, haven't they? Uh, if you go to the webpage today, you'll see pictures from uh, where he did his, uh, I'm assuming, Friday photo walk recently in a place called Odense. Just beautiful, earthy tones. I mean, yeah, when I look at your street work, I think, uh, I know, I know I shouldn't feel this way. I should feel inspired to go and make my own. But there are, <laughs> there are moments, Dennis, when uh, the human in me just says, oh, I could never do that. They are beautiful. They are inspirational. They're beautiful. Wonderful work. It really is. And you are the master of inviting me into the shadow in a scene. And you place things. My, uh, my youngest, Thomas, I was showing him your pictures as I was building the, uh, the show page, actually. I was, sh- I was showing him the pictures at the breakfast bar. Uh, we're not supposed to have laptops and phones at the breakfast bar. I was entirely breaking the rules. But all the same, I was showing him your pictures and he said, wow, look at that one. And the one he means is the picture of the person coming down the steps with the, uh, uh, the bridge structure, top, uh, top, top, of the, um, top of the frame. And I, I suppose some people would look at it and say, oh, no, that's not quite right. I mean, the composition should be that person walking the other way or, or it should be this or it could be that. Um, but... Do you know what? You captured his imagination immediately. He said, that's fantastic. And that's, uh, that's an 11-year-old boy that's only recently really got into photography. And uh, he proper sparkle in his eyes, Dennis, really. He, he really had a proper sparkle in his eyes. Fantastic picture. And uh, <laughs> you, make, you make actually taking a picture out of a coffee shop window an absolute artful. You really do. The boy on the bicycle, yes. Those tones match the building behind it. It's a subtle picture, but it's just so well observed. Um, I don't know how long it takes you on one of these walks to think, oh, there, that's that, put that there, place that there. I don't know whether it's become something that you not so much almost see, but um, subconsciously become aware of as you round a corner and think, ah, oh, that's, that's for me, that's what I'm doing with that picture. So thank you for those. A dense um, history because I know you like to know where the good folks that listen to this show are listening, um, is a, uh, it's the third largest city in Denmark land. It has a population of 180,760 and is the main city of the island of Funen. By road, it's located 45 kilometres north of Svendborg and 144 kilometres to the south of Aarhus, in the middle of our street for Madness fans. Um, the name Odense is derived from Odans Ve, meaning Odans Sanctuary, as the area was known as a sanctuary for worshippers of a Nordic god called Odan. Odan, actually, also, or Odans, was, um, was my favourite restaurant in London. In a, a small... Uh, I had to look it up to remind myself, but it was in a... There was my notes... Uh, Devonshire Street, there we go, Devonshire Street. He used to be owned by a famous restaurateur called Peter Langen. Uh, and he bought all, the, bought all these amazing paintings. He was a real art collector. And it was a, a proper mishmash of, uh, of pictures. In the day where, the days where mishmashes, people didn't really appreciate mishmashes. It was all very organised, I seem to remember, really. And he'd put up this mishmash, and it looked a bit messy, actually. But it, had, uh, it was a mess formed of David Hockney pictures. So that's not really a mess, let's be honest. And I, I haven't been there for years and years, and there's a very good reason, because it closed down. But I didn't realise that until I, I looked at it and thought, oh, now there would be a great place to celebrate coming out of, uh, of uh, lockdown at last, when we, when we really have completely come out of it and say, what's a mask? But it's closed down, and um, it's been replaced. In its place, you've got, uh, you've got a chain restaurant. And I must admit, a little piece of my heart just sank a bit, really. I just thought, oh. The duck l'orange with onion and goat's cheese tart tartin. So ahead of its time in those days. 
washed down with 90 quid bottles of vino to fall over, paid for by the record company I was dining with, is no longer. Uh, but Dennis, your picture's made up for it, so, uh, so thank you for those. Um, and a wonderful mail from Dennis Linden, and you'll see all the accompanying pics on the web show page, uh, uh, along with um, Dennis Den <laughs> Denmark, De Dennis Denmark, Denmark, Dennis. Do you uh, do you remember it was? Oh God, this has got to be going back about a month now, maybe more. Uh, I was asking you to look in your attic, or maybe uh, maybe your parents' attic, and find a, an old camera and use it, or be or better still, find some old film in it and see what's on it. Then, then you'll find out why the curtains were really twitching in Arcasia Avenue. But, the, but those camera finds, they don't exclusively have to be uh, parents, um, as this mail from Dennis Linden actually proves. Uh, Hi, Neil. I caught something on your show about old sentimental cameras being dusted off and used again. I attach one of my favourites in the past, which you might find interesting to share. I popped a roll of Kodak this week into it to see what happens. This Zeiss Contaflex 2 was given to me by an appreciative patient about a decade ago. He was moving into an assisted living facility and he didn't have room for it. So this was an especially meaningful gift because this was his father's camera purchased and used from about 1958 to the early 70s. See, a camera with a story, I am already glued. So anyway, here's the camera, some 60 years on, I opened up the cover to the photovoltaic sensor and the meter, bing, popped into life. I wasn't sure how accurate it would be, but it seems to, seems to work. I hope I have the ISO set to 400-ish. You turn the outer ring until the circle matches the metre needle and then wowzer. Who uses the word wowzer, Dennis? Mm. Uh, ISO 400, F8, 1 500th. Wind up to block the film, lower the mirror to compose, release, and all goes dark until you wind the film around again. Now that's what I call shutter blackout. I've dropped off the film at the local uh, Rite Aid drugstore, the only place in town that still has film processing. We're waiting now for the next instalment to see if it has a light leak and so, and so on. We'll see in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, as to the adventure while making the pictures, and these are the pictures I, I guess Dennis hopefully is going to send us, hopefully that will come out, lots of hope there. Um, I was making my, my usual round of the Medford Commons where the security guard bumped into me and said, you need to check out the mural being painted around the corner. The city commissioned a mural depicting the history of Medford, from the gold rush to the train to the current commercial interests. Kirk, in brackets, not Captain, from Alien Artifact Studios, was up on the jack lift spray painting clouds. I told you, you can't make this stuff up. I have to say, if you look at the picture, by the way, of, um, of Kirk, uh, and, and you're aware of this particular filmmaker I'm about to mention, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know Kirk, but I tell you what, th this chap is the spitting image of British filmmaker and mentor Philip Bloom. When I say I don't know Kirk, I, I, I've not met him, but I tell you what, he looks like Philip Bloom. Honestly, you can't get more Bloom-like. Really, you can't. Uh, we talked about this project says Dennis, uh, that I was taking up the challenge of a, a crazy Englishman, <laughs> do you mean me, uh, to shoot a roll of film on a sentimental old camera. Um, I love it. I just sort of, a, a, a jump of joy that I'm known as a, a crazy Englishman uh, when I'm setting you these tasks, to shoot a roll of film on a sentimental old camera. I took photos and made a portrait of him with a 60-year-old Contaflex 2. To be sure, I added a few with my pocket Ricoh GR3. He beamed, though, when he saw the Contaflex. Did I call it a Contraflex a moment ago? <laughs> like a Contraflow. Uh, and its red velvet-lined brown leather ever-ready case. He regaled me with memories of his dad's camera, the same vintage, it's remarkable how art and photography inspire shared moments, even between strangers. And then my wife drove off and left me. <laughs> well, for a while. Eventually, she picked me up a few blocks away as if to teach me a lesson not to talk to strangers in back alleys downtown. Well, I showed her, didn't I? Um, not really. A few additional photos the light meter attached and some small JPEGs on the Rico of Kirk from Alien Artifacts to tide you over until the film is returned. Yeah, so you can see those on the, the show page today. It's fascinating to look at those old cameras, isn't it? I don't know, it's fascinating to me. Lovely. Thank you very much for sending them in. And yes, please scan those pictures in when you receive them and send them on in because um, 
So it almost feels like um, a cliffhanger here. What happened to the pictures? What happened? What was in the box? Don't look in the box. Uh, Dennis, I'm looking forward then to these pictures and the next instalment will be fascinating. Talking of which, good link. Uh, here's chapter two of my conversation with uh, Simon Buckley. And the, the very end of my chat on this shorter chapter reveals why the title of the show is what it is today. You said on a, a radio show that the virus has made you think very differently about your life as a photographer, Simon, that the, that the solo walks being by and with yourself, photographing the world after dark has reconnected you with uh, your city. It's been it's been possible to find a, a positive experience rather than just see it as negative. It has. And I think I think when I mean, I've been self-employed all my life from the age of all my adult life, very much from the age of 21. And so, again, I think you have an advantage in terms of that sense of isolation that came to a lot of people. That's how most freelancers live, you know. (laughs) And again, we are like woodland creatures forever sniffing the air and wondering how to survive and, and, and which path to take next. So I didn't feel perhaps quite as confronted by those aspects of lockdown as other people did. Um, but yes, you're right. It did bring me a tremendous opportunity to walk uh, parts of the city, which I'd neglected to walk for some time. And I've, I grew up in the town just north of Manchester in Bolton, but Manchester has been part of my life since I was a boy, really. And I've lived here all my adult life. And I used to know all of the city pretty well, I think. But now I think that that knowledge had fallen away. And so pushing myself into new areas was was a fantastic thing to do. And, you know, I think you can be you can be very bored by a city, no matter how dynamic it is, if you're not careful. You know, you can take things too much for granted and you become very you can become very city centre focused as well. And Manchester really isn't the city centre. It's it's kind of slightly mimicking London in, in its central areas in yeah. terms of what it's trying to do. And, and and a lot of the city, a lot of the dynamism comes from beyond that inner ring road. There's a kind of tarmac moat around the city centre and it's, uh, you know, it's an, a, a little bit of an economic apartheid, I suppose. And so to push yourself into these suburbs is to really discover, you know, the Manchester that's uh, that still the driving force for the city being so unusual. I recently walked uh, a little of the Liverpool and Leeds Canal and one, one thing I photographed and noticed and what I see in your work too is, is your own fact fascination for the old that's been left and maintained alongside the regeneration you know old old cranes still rise canal side that once would have taken goods from barges and bits of winch gear now now a decorative nod to a past rather than anything useful in practical terms little paths off that lead nowhere they, they've all become photographic fodder or or interest really for not quite light haven't they I suppose so to a degree. I think, you know, these old dinosaurs left there, you know, the skeletons of these things that caused uh, the great industrial age, you know, we can't help but be fascinated by them because all we know of them is through history books. You know, we haven't worked those machines. We haven't lived the life of often near destitution. We haven't been threatened by injury with them. You know, to us, they are kind of ornaments. And I think the fact that they still decorate our pathways is fascinating. And, you know, there's a lot of very interesting discussion around heritage, which I like to think not quite like contributes to because places do need to be dynamic and I'm not fixed on the fact that everything old has to stay. I think it's about if we are going to change it, how do we change it? Not that necessarily we shouldn't change it. But certainly I think if you're walking the canals um, and, and some of these old city streets, it is important that some things are retained because it's almost as if, you know, souls are kept kept in there somehow, yeah. isn't it? You know, people yeah. worked with these places. They they suffered in their lives. You know, they, they strived to exist and survive and i think we owe it to them actually to allow some of these things to survive so that when we look at them it may provide us even with a few moments of empathy and consideration and then look at perhaps how that is is used in our present day i mean there are mills in manchester being converted some of them are already converted into really lovely apartment blocks now yeah. worth quite a lot of money but actually these were places of terror these were places where children died. You know, these were places where people worked for poverty wages and were maimed and left without any means of support. You know, these were places of absolute human exploitation. There was slavery in any, any other words. I have got mixed feelings around that because I appreciate the beauty of the buildings. And I think they're necessary to be kept. We do need to understand that just because something is heritage, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing, you know. Something that you do with, with your work that I talk about, because I have not, not just a vested kind of interest, but equally a, a, a genuine passion for, is sound. You, you've had a podcast. You do appear on a local radio show talking about your work and your projects. Already on 
Today's show, I've waxed lyrical about a, a boxer project earlier that, that embraced using links to sounds within a magazine. What, what fascinates you about sound as a photographer? If, if, if you will, the, the sound in your pictures, such as your wonderful photo story about the brass band in your area, the, the sound of your stills, if you like. Yeah, it's an interesting way of putting it. I remember that, the sounds of the stills. I think, again, it's about telling that whole story. I've, you know, I've been a photographer, really, probably since I was about 14 or 15. I have a vague idea why I remember why I started. But I've often felt it's a limited medium. Um, you can tell some great stories with it. And um, obviously, it, it, it's taken me through my life and brought me a very lovely career. But ultimately, when I'm standing behind the tripod in the morning, I'm very aware of the scent of the, of the streets around me and the bird song and, and the various sounds as the city wakes up. And for me, I'm only telling a part of the story if I don't get to relate how I felt. So again, that's why I add text, you know, in terms of talking about something like the encounter with the mm. woman on Old Mill Street. And therefore, sound becomes very relevant. So I'm, as I'm talking to you now, I'm, I'm putting together the next radio show, which is um, inspired by shortwave radio and number stations and yeah. those messages that spies yeah. send. Yeah. Um, and I've I've used that as a way of uh, causing me to walk through the streets in the city centre, taking snippets of conversation. And it's a bit like when you tune an old radio, an old valve radio, and you kind of pick up fractions of seconds of, of stations passing you by before you go into the next one. And it's, it's therefore, what is the city trying to tell you with these little moments of sound? And a photograph can take you so far, but I think sound is the most evocative of things, really. I think, you know, I, I, you know I'm conscious of the fact that I'm talking about my grandfather as, as a way of bookending this particular show. And one of the things that you lose when, when somebody dies is the sound of their voice. If you mm. haven't recorded them, I can still picture his body movements. I, mm. can, I can still picture uh, so much about him, but it, can I hear his voice? No, it, it's mm. gone, you know, and it can never be returned to me, really. I have a sense of what it was like, and it's lost. And I think, you know, if we've got sound, um, I think it's very powerful. And therefore, it's becoming increasingly important to me to use that in my work. I think also you can, I, you know, I kind of think about that thing that Bowie said about, you know, it's only when you're out in water and you're on the tips of your toes and the water's around your neck that the thing starts to become interesting. And I do think it's important to trip yourself up on a regular basis to definitely put yourself outside your comfort zone. I mean, I, I genuinely don't know what I'm doing with these radio shows. You know, I do make it up as I go along. And, and I think that's, I, I like that. I like the challenge. I like the kind of the visceral combat that comes with not quite knowing how it's going to pan out, actually. And I think because I've been taking photographs for so long, I mean, you know, since the early 80s, I suppose, really, if you go back to my teenage years, I don't mean this to sound big headed at all. Um, but I don't fear not getting the picture I want when I'm out now. I kind of have gone out and looked at it the night before and I kind of have roughly worked out how street lights might fall in a place. And then, although there's a sense that you can't actually tell how it's going to look until the light emerges, there is that sort of little bit of excitement when the light's lifting and you've got that kind of brief period of time. But ultimately, I can't think of a time I've been out to do Not Quite Light and I haven't come back with a picture that I think is usable. Whereas when I go out with sound, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's there's no given to that at all. Or when I start on my radio show, I I could get two thirds through it and see the deadline looming and thinking I ain't going to make this, you know. And I'm still at that stage with with the uh, with the show, and um, uh, and I like that. It keeps me young and it keeps me fresh. And I think you need a little bit of fear in your work. The wonderful Simon Buckley. What a an absolute privilege to talk to him. I'll come back to him in just a moment. But the sun has literally come out at the right moment for me to to make a picture. Well. I when I turn the microphone on, it's illuminated this huge transmitter. There's a puff of cumulus behind it and uh, some trees foreground to make this dirty foreground. So I'm going to stoop down a bit because there's some more vegetation that's kind of on its way out now, seasonally. But uh, it should make quite an interesting picture rather than just just mast standing proudly against the, the backdrop. So what have we got? Let's stoop down. Uh, shutter speed 640th. Let's choose F4, F4, which is usually where most of my pictures sit, isn't it? Really, I'm not. I'm not. Do um, you know? I've become less of a real shallow shooter, um, if you pardon the phrase. And F4 shutter speed 1800, ISO 160, and there we go. The huge mast. That's called Hannington. That's the one. And I know now you're going to look it up and say, Neil, there's 
18 others that are actually taller than that one. <laughs> if you must, please do. But there are so many things, uh, uh, you know, to take from that chat with Simon. And I, I do hope he comes back. I truly do. Um, I'd, I'd love to spend a walk on the streets at, uh, at 4 a.m., in the morning making a podcast with him truth be known but i i really like the the concept of um well, so many things really of what simon said but i love this concept of uh, using your iphone or your smartphone other flavors are available your iphone is a sketchbook or sketch pad great fantastic so well what have we learned this week I like to think uh, i've learned about sound a little more and how potent and inventive it can be from our our good friend John Baisley, our patron of the week, who did that boxer story at the start. And of course, Simon talking about sound right at the end as well. I loved, uh, I loved the Susan Jeffers rejection letter. That made, <laughs> that made me chuckle, knowing just what a bestseller that became. Hold on a minute. Oh, can't get through. There we go. They've locked you out, Neil. Ah. You can't keep me out of this field because this is taking me all the way into some woods, which is, uh, which is relevant for a conversation I'm going to have with you in just a second's time with uh, Hannington Mast, just sort of poking out of those woods. Um, I loved, um, I love Kean's idea of finding stuff in the wilds around your home, making art with it and then photographing it. Inspired by that, I've said inspired 348 times today, I realise. Dennis Linden's wonderful story a moment ago about the, the camera left to him by a, by a patient. Uh, there's some cracking pictures on the show page today. It was great to hear as well from Nicky Heppenstall about uh, Remember My Baby. Um, Yen's very personal story. And of course, I, I learned a bit about the god Odan and the fact that Odan's restaurant is no longer. Whew. So uh, McDonald's for lunch then. But this show is made by you, for you. So please, please, please keep sending, your, uh, sending in your letters. They are so important. Your pictures too. And don't feel that because you don't have the, the experience of uh, some of those that you hear me talk of. And I waxed <laughs> lyrical, didn't I, about Dennis Skarm's pictures. For good reason. Uh, because it turns out, as uh, Simon said, you can make the, the most extraordinary pictures from, from iPhones. And... Uh, well, everything has value, doesn't it? Everything has value. Next week, we're talking to, to Simon Baxter. He of, uh, well, he makes these extraordinary pictures in woodland. And he's really inspired me to go look for some woodland. And I'm not going to give too much away because there's something he says that I, I know is going to be really valuable for us both in next week's show. It's, and it has. <laughs> Here comes another mention, 300 and, no, no, 681st mention of Inspired. And it's inspired me to make it all the way to the top of the hill to see this, this Hannington transmitter that's nestled within its own woodland. Well, that's what it looks like. I mean, let me, I'm sort of the other side of, the, of, the, uh, of where I was just a moment ago making the initial picture of it. But if I take, a, if I take another picture now, if I make another picture now, you'll see what I mean. It's, uh, it's sort of poking out of this, this woodland. Uh, F4, I'm about to be buzzed by a helicopter by the sound of it. Shutter speed, or oh, the same, oh, well, you know, 2900. ISO 160. There we go. There's woodland here. Now, I made a picture right at the start of the, uh, of the show today where I sort of scouted a location for a, another piece of woodland that I'd like to investigate during next week's show. So uh, I might as well tell you, I'm, I'm coming back here again, but um, I'm coming purposefully into the woods for next week's for next week's show so I'm, I'm going to do what Simon does which is uh, scout this out right now uh, while we listen to some music in a moment's time uh, tomorrow on Patreon <laughs> I'm going to try and make both of us NFT zillionaires so I am Rodney are you Neil well I'm not so sure about that but maybe by the end of it we'll have a better understanding of what the devil NFTs actually are and, um, and if you'd like to, if you could leave a, a review on, uh, on the, uh, the app that you choose, that really helps us uh, bundle. Um, let's play out then with Maya Isakovic. Hold on a minute, Neil. Didn't you play out with uh, Maya Isakovic last week? Oh, yeah. Yes, I did. 
And usually I would choose a different artist, but I can hear Susan Jeffers shouting down, just do it! I mean, it's not so much fear, but you know what I mean. And, and not because it's got Brave in the title of this particular song, which it does, but because uh, I was listening to it while I was piecing together some of the letters this week. And uh, there was one particular moment, and I just thought, huh, this song feels so right. So, uh, Maya Isakovich again, uh, to close the show. And uh, to spend just a few moments walking and thinking about what we've heard today and what we've learned from our wonderful guest, Simon Buckley. Through this world, where you guide me? Through this pain, where you always hold my hand? When I need you, when I don't know what I'm doing with myself, I'm a lost soul. Walking through this world like I have some idea When I don't, I don't And I take on the baggage Cause I think that I can And I wait for the right time To go with my plan And come to you And tell you how I feel playing us out this week I know second week in a row we'll be playing all Maya's uh, songs by the maybe her entire album uh, in the next few weeks I don't think so it's nice to choose some different different songs but that one this one sort of worked for this week I think and that's it for this week keep sending your emails in to uh, studio at photography daily dot shows an awful lot of gates around this week aren't there yes Neil um, so that I can feature you in the photo walk. Thank you to the amazing artlist.io for the fabulous music that we have. Also for our patrons, you are marvellous, every single one of you. And I mean that absolutely, sincerely. And I look forward to talking with you on the, um, on the podcast over on Patreon tomorrow. And, uh, well, well, we'll be returning... Oh, just quickly, if you are sending in pictures, 2,000 pixels wide. 
uh, please, on the long on the long side. And uh, they're really important. Send us your stories about where you've been walking, what you've been doing, what you've been seeing, any ideas that you have. If you found one of those old cameras, fantastic. And if you have any ideas for the island where only photographers can live, the island of Bacasia, which I think is a republic just off the west of... Um, of the, the western coast of Perth now then send those in as well for a, for a bit of daft eccentricity we need to come back here next week Car. why? well because I'm going to go exploring in the woods that I've just left behind me ooh yeah inspired ooh, that might be the last eye that I used this week count them for next week it could be like one of those wedding games what do you mean? where they take a drink every single time the groom says something in his speech well if you'd have been drinking every single time car that I mentioned I today, you wouldn't be allowed on the road for several weeks. I oh, know. So yeah, we're going to come back here next week, do a bit of woodland adventuring, uh, because uh, Simon uh, Baxter is my guest, and he is uh, one of the foremost woodland explorers, photographically, uh, in the UK, I think. His pictures are absolutely gorgeous. I can't wait to uh, to be speaking with him on the on the show next week, so... I think that's it for this week. Come on, car. Let's go home. Via McDonald's, as O'Dan's isn't open anymore. That's a shame. Yeah, but a lot less expensive. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.